Hello everybody and welcome back to Monbiosis on COP26.tv. Now, I've been in this business for a very long time, 36 years in fact, as a journalist and activist covering environmental issues. And for a lot of that time, I have felt an intense frustration that a lot of the key communication about issues which are fundamentally about science has been left to journalists and activists. And it's often been really hard to get scientists to come forward and speak about why their disciplines matter and why their findings matter. I think there's been uh, generally scientific reticence, which is a phenomenon I hope to talk about in this programme. It, it became a particular issue a few years ago when the climate deniers were out in force and they were just uh, pouring uh, tar all over climate science and making all sorts of extraordinary and extreme claims about why it was all nonsense. And to a large extent, it was left to activists to confront them. And there were very few scientists who seemed prepared to come forward and defend their own field, which made it very difficult for us because we'd find ourselves in a studio often up against someone with professor or doctor in front of their name, um, sometimes in a completely different discipline, but you know, very often these retired professors seem to get paid off by oil companies to uh, talk complete nonsense about climate in the autumn of their life. And then they would say, well, who are you? I said, well, um, you know, I've got, I took a science degree, you know, I've got some background, but of course I'm not a scientist. And most of us activists weren't scientists. And so we were always on the back foot. Well, I'm glad to say that things are changing. A lot more scientists are coming forward. And in our programme today, I'm talking to the three crucial voices, I feel, on trying to get this critical issue properly communicated by people in their own community within science. Um, all of them great scientists, but also great communicators. Um, Professor Julia Steinberger, Dr. Dr. Aaron Thierry, and Dr. Emily Grossman, all of whom have already made their mark by ensuring that the voice of science is heard in public policy debates. So, Julia, if I could start with you, uh, what should scientists be telling us about the state of the planet and where we're headed? So I think this is a this is a crucial point, and it's it's very much been undercommunicated, uh, partly because um, scientists are cautious by nature, by training, and as you said, they've also been to some extent beaten into submission, or at least um, beaten off uh, the public stage by climate deniers. So you know we're not we're not trained as scientists to get into fist fights or to have that kind of interaction. We're trained to write papers, and hopefully somebody reads them. Um, in terms of what needs to be communicated, the, the, the situation could not be more dire. And every year as we learn more, we learn more about just how dire the situation is because we're already entering into the climate space, the warming space, where the impacts become evident and where we see how sensitive the Earth system, Earth systems are to this warming and how, um, how fragile they are, in fact. And so generally, every time we get a new piece of news, it's on the bad side of the range that was expected, or even sometimes outside the range, for instance, in the case of um, uh, Arctic ice uh, melting. So I should uh, first of all say that I'm not um, a physical scientist. Um, so I'm just reading the papers, reading the reports, same as everybody else. But in terms of some, some headline messages, I think these are really crucial to understand, is that we are, without exaggeration, facing a trajectory and impacts that will um, obliterate the possibility of human civilization within, you know, by the year 2100. And that is not an exaggeration. And the, the fact that that is not widely known, that the stakes are so extraordinarily high, I think is something that really, uh, really should cause a lot of people to, you know, from, from media to, to scientists to, to hang their heads in, in, in real shame and real horror. The reason that the situation is so dire is that one of the things we have to understand is, by the way, human civilization has a definition, if you want in this case. Not all civilizations are civilized, but it, the, the most easy explanation is we can feed human populations with agriculture. That's sort of like the baseline. And um, 
one thing to understand is that as a species, we were about um, 250,000 years old, maybe. And that involved lots of ice ages, uh, which are quite uncomfortable. Um, but in the last 12,000 years, we've been, since the last ice age, we've been in this tiny little narrow sort of warm band of temperature called the Holocene. And it's during that time that our species has been able to do things like develop agriculture, like develop cities, writing, all of that stuff came in this really narrow band of temperature. And we as humans depend on climate stability for our existence, for our societies. This is what allows us to thrive. And right now we have left the Holocene. The Holocene is already in the rear view mirror. And um, we're, 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 we're zooming out of it at a rate of about half a degree per decade on our current. So, so if we keep sort of our current emissions levels, that's where that's that's the rate of change. And um, and, and the, the, the intense danger of that situation has not been communicated sufficiently. Um, what this means in terms of uh, ecosystems and biodiversity loss is just immense. So uh, there was a paper published by um, Rachel Warren and her team in 2018 that said that, uh, so on our current trajectory, we're headed for three degrees, give or take. Um, at three degrees, give or take, by 2100, we're talking about putting um, roughly half of all plants and insect species at risk of extinction, i.e. they would lose about half of their geographic range. At three degrees, entire swaths of the tropics, including large parts of India, the Indonesia, um, the Philippines and large parts of Latin America become uninhabitable due to heat stress. So humans cannot live there. Um, the, the stress on crop production is immense. So we're just talking about a future that is, um, that is unlivable. And the fact that we're not discussing this topic with those stakes at hand, that we're discussing it as, oh, it's going to cost too much, oh, it might inconvenience some billionaires, um, that, that it's, it's just not, it's, it just doesn't make sense in terms of the, the magnitude of the stakes we face. And I think that that's what I would really, really try to bring to the fore. Thank you, Julian. And, and actually, you, you remind me in saying that, that we're facing really the greatest communications failure there's ever been, hasn't there? I mean, this is the biggest challenge humanity has ever faced. And yet, great majority of people, you know, if you came up to someone in the street and said, name more than one greenhouse gas, roughly what's the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, how much has the temperature risen since pre-industrial times, I suspect most people would not be able to answer that. And, and, and I hasten to say, I'm absolutely not blaming scientists for this. I think primarily the problem is the media. You know, over and above anything else, it's my industry which has manifestly failed on this and failed by design in some cases, you know, providing massive platforms for climate deniers, BBC channel controllers swearing at producers who came to them with environmental topics and the rest of it. However, you know, we do obviously all need to play our role in this. It's all hands on deck now, isn't it? So, so Aaron, what, what would you say are the main reasons why scientists have so far or until recently been so reluctant to speak out? Right well I think what we've got to bear in mind is the fact that scientists have themselves been under attack from fossil fuel interests for a really long time whenever they have spoken out. So there's uh, lots of instances where we have climate scientists for example like Michael Mann who uh, you know has been attacked personally had lawsuits filed against him Friends, uh, freedom of information requests come in uh, to try and hound him. And those kind of uh, efforts were really to intimidate scientists and to try and say, if you put your head above the parapet, uh, this is what's going to happen to you. Um, so that's kind of made scientists inherently quite cautious about becoming, uh, uh, stepping into the political arena and, and talking about these things publicly. But I think there's a, there's a lot of other reasons to do with as well the culture of science. And so, you know, the fact that we're all as scientists trained to be real specialists in our areas of expertise. And that means that we tend to work in very narrow silos um, of disciplines. And we often are very reluctant to speak outside of that uh, disciplinary expertise and make comments on more general areas of, of um, um, matters. And so, so when we're asked, you know, about issues to do with say um what how, how should we respond as a society to climate change often our instinct is to say well i, I just study these gases in the atmosphere i don't necessarily uh, uh um 
I can't necessarily speak outside of beyond that. I'd also say that uh, scientists tend to focus on, um, you know, what we're unsure about uh, more than what we're sure about, because that's what that's what's interesting to them, right? That's their research. So, so they tend to talk a lot about the uncertainty that's still left and the, the puzzles that we're still working on uh, scientifically, but they don't really convey as clearly as they could, in my opinion, the things that we are absolutely certain of, which is, of course, that we that we are warming the planet uh, in in dangerous ways, and that if we don't phase out all fossil fuel emissions um, within just a few decades, that that this will become completely out of hand. Um, so, so that's a, another kind of tendency amongst the scientific community to be quite conservative in how we talk about these things. But then I think also the fact that scientists are themselves human beings, you know, we are uh, ourselves frightened and terrified even by what we're discovering. And that makes us again, often, uh, you know, uh, anxious about thinking and talking about these things and, and trying to explore the full scope of, of what, what is actually implied by what our research is telling us. At the end of the day, we still have to go home and spend time with our, our families and, and want to kind of switch off and, and kind of act as though everything's normal. And it's really fighting against that instinct that's in all of us, not just scientists, you know, to kind of want to bury our heads and, and forget about it um, and, and to look away um, uh, from the full implications of what's happening. So that kind of state of, um, you know, psych psychoanalysts call it disavowal sometimes, that, that we, we know on one hand and yet we don't know on the other hand, or we pretend that we don't know uh, as we go about our normal lives. And I think scientists are sometimes as guilty of that as, as everybody else. And so it's really trying to um, bridge that, I guess, that we need to do and help people live uh, their lives uh, um, and bring together everything uh, that they know so that we're living more in truth with, with what we know. And then I think finally, I think there is a kind of, again, um, you know, a, a real reverence of being seen to be objective uh, in science, and, and that's seen as really important to how science is, is perceived and done. Um, but this objectivity um, itself <coughs> um, is kind of often conflict, con uh, confounded with being non-political. Uh, so so it's seen, uh, scientists sometimes see that if they were to become more political, that would somehow uh, impinge upon their perceived objectivity. Um, I, I think this is a real mistake myself. Um, but I think, you know, we've got to start questioning. There's a, there's a really great quote by a, a professor from Oxford University, Amanda Power, where she says, you know, do we really believe that the best thinking in the 21st century is done at uh, some kind of profound uh, remove from, from a profound personal investment uh, in a livable future? You know, it just doesn't make sense for scientists to pretend that they don't care about the fact that we are now heading to catastrophe, as Julia was explaining. And it's really, I think, on us as scientists now to um, you know, get out on the streets and, and raise our voices alongside the protesters uh, so that the message is getting conveyed as clearly as possible just how serious the situation is now. Thank you. That's a very compelling account, Aaron. Thank you. Um, Emily, so given those constraints that Aaron has um, so um, deftly spelt out there, what can be done to encourage scientists to find that courage and speak out more? Well, I, I think, as Aaron put really, really clearly, the issue is partly that scientists have been trained through fear, but also through our training in itself to not speak out because there's a sort of unspoken contract, if you like, between scientists and the government, scientists and the media, scientists and the public, which is that we as scientists report impartially, unemotionally and very gently and fact-based um, on our findings. So scientists who've been working in these fields, as Aaron, uh, Aaron said, spanning many different parts of the field, all, all coming together, each of those scientists, uh, we've been trained to just simply impart the facts. And the contract is that if we impart the facts in a way that is just simple clarity, this is what's happening, this is the percentage certainty, this is how likely it is that by 2050, half the world's population won't have enough food and water to drink, which, by the way, is where we're heading. Um, that if we simply say that in very unemotive and very sensible terms, that we will be listened to, that the government will act according to that threat level, that the media will report on that according to that threat level. So there are many scientists 
scientists out there who are still thinking, well, you know, we're, we're telling people the facts. It, it's it's up to them. But the fact is that, that that sort of unspoken contract that I mentioned has been broken because for 40 years, scientists have been impartially reporting on the facts, unemotionally uh, giving information and data and graphs and, and stats and everything. But it hasn't been acted upon anywhere close to appropriately to what is being reported. So I think scientists are beginning to realise that actually something more is needed because but but the training, everything in us has been trained not to do that. Everything in us has been trained to say, well, here's just some more facts. But the problem is, is that if the public aren't hearing the sense of horror that goes with those facts in our own fear, and if the public aren't seeing the government acting in proportion to those facts and they aren't seeing the media reporting in proportion to those facts, they think, OK, well, I'm hearing that, you know, half we've lost half of the trees uh, since the beginning of agriculture and I'm hearing that global harvests are already down and it's likely that they're going to be a lot further you know, down in the next 10, 20 years. They're hearing it, but they're not feeling that level of alarm because there's this sort of cognitive dissonance and they're not seeing the government acting as if it's an emergency. They're not seeing the media acting as if it's an emergency. And scientists are saying, well, you know, we've done all we can. We've, we've told you the facts. So that's why what's having to happen now is something that is very, very uncomfortable for most scientists which is that we are needing to empower and inspire scientists to speak louder and to speak from a more emotive place, to speak from a more um, alarming, not alarmist, because, you know, it is alarming and we don't need to be alarmist. We don't need to exaggerate. We don't need to kind of try and make it louder than it is because it is that bad. But most scientists are trained not to speak in that way. So what's going on now is that scientists are starting to come together. Um, myself and Aaron co-founded a community called Scientists for Extinction Rebellion, which I know Julia is also a member of now, where we have tried to help and support scientists to say, look, we have to do more. You know, I know it's not our job. We have done our job, but our warnings, our alarm bells have not been listened to anywhere close to a proportionally to what they mean. So we now need to come together and we need to do more. And we need to do that by supporting each other to do more. So what we've tried to do with our community is to get scientists to actually realise that when we come together, we can support and encourage each other to be brave, to be bold, to be courageous and to step outside of our sort of laboratories or our offices or our research um, places and to come together and actually get onto the streets and to take action because it's the scientists that have the the weight of expertise and hopefully the trust although that is being eroded which is Aaron spoke very eloquently on um, that we do have the information we do have the facts when we come together we can bring the information together from many different disciplines which hasn't happened much before the IPCC has done that but it hasn't been done much before in a way that is understandable to the general public or to people who know little science we need to come together we need to pool our information. We need to talk about how we communicate this in a way that the public can understand and children can get on board with. And we need to show the public that it really is that bad by getting on the streets. So, you know, we are trying to create an, an environment where scientists know that other scientists are speaking out. And the more that scientists speak out, the more others are encouraged to realise that that's what needs to happen. And to that end, one of the fir first things that we did when we founded the Scientists for Extinction Rebellion community uh, two years ago now, is that we drafted a declaration, um, a declaration in support of nonviolent direct action, basically civil disobedience, in the face of government inaction in combating the climate and ecological emergency, to say that, you know, the time has come where we must now speak out. It is our moral duty as scientists. You know, we have been failed. We been failed in what was our contract, how we were to report on facts. So it's now our moral duty to do more and to, to force people to listen to us, to force the public to listen to us so that they will put pressure on governments, to force the governments to listen to us so that they will realise just how bad it is. So, you know, we've been communities within the Scientists for Extinction Rebellion community across the globe have been coming together putting their name against um, the declarations. We've we've had um, 1,700 scientists who are actually saying that if they themselves don't do it, but at least that they may not be doing it themselves, but they are supporting scientists to essentially, it, where necessary, break the law because it is that bad. And, you know, you have to realise, as I'm sure you know, George, that for scientists to be saying that, for scientists who are by nature, as Julia said, and as Aaron said, very cautious people, you know, we're trained to absolutely look at everything that could go against 
our hypothesis of what's bad. And we've really got to a point where it really is terrifying and catastrophic. We, we really are looking towards civil unrest, societal collapse. Um, if we don't change course now and we're not changing course, the governments have not been taking the action they say they've been taking. Um, you know, people say, oh, yes, you know, we've gone up by a degree or half a degree. Julia said half a degree every decade. But if we actually put that in what this means, that's the equivalent to five atomic bombs worth of heat energy going off in our atmosphere every second. And it's that heat energy that's causing changes to our climate, not just heat, but extra rain, floods, storms, droughts, monsoons. And then we've got to look at the what we're doing to our land. And when you when we put all this together, we get um more diseases because of the extra heat. We get deforestation leading to damage to our soils. We get extreme weather leading to damage to our soils. When we put those together with lots of insects and lots of earthworms, we find so we find soils that are going to be unable to grow crops. And when we put that together with droughts and floods, we find that, you know, in the next 10, 20 years, we're going to be severely compromised. We're, we live in a globally interconnected society. If we see damage to crops in other parts of the globe, it's going to have a knock on effect. If we have not enough to feed ourselves, we're going to have food rights that's going to lead to civil unrest wars and that is going to have a knock-on effect on the very fabric of society so you know what we really need now is for scientists to realize that it's not that we're being blamed no one is i believe should be blaming the scientists you know we've been doing what we were supposed to do but that what we do need now is for scientists to show in their actions bring themselves into the equation say i am terrified i am horrified i am on the streets for the sake of my children for the sake of humanity and actually no one's listening to us so we have to take more radical action we have to get people to listen even though it goes against the very fabric of who most of us are as human beings Thank you. I, I can see why the three of you have come to the fore as communicators on this issue. All very inspiring and powerful answers there. Julia, tell me something about your work in this field in trying to get scientists to speak out, but also about the extent to which that has exposed you and made things difficult for you. Um, that's a good question. So I'm already uh, a rather senior academic. So by the time I started doing this kind of thing more openly, I already had job security, and that was one of the things that I actually felt compelled me to step out further in front because there are a whole bunch of people who do not have that. Uh, you know, academic career paths are very insecure and with temporary contracts. And so I think that that's also something that really made it worth it to do it, um, not just to do it, but to do it out in the open and to say, this has to become acceptable. Um, and uh, I guess one of the one of the, f the first ways of doing that was to sort of try to to school my colleagues, <laughs> gently, I hope, but still, um, you know, when Extinction Rebellion came to the fore in the UK in 2018, uh, there were a bunch of people, sort of, more, you know, sort of more traditional scientists saying, oh, well, that's a bit much, isn't it? And aren't these demands a bit much? And, well, can't we do it another way? And it's just like, listen, somebody out there is finally taking your work seriously. Do you, do you mind being supportive? You know, because that, so so um, I think that that I think that that probably helped a bit. So in terms of saying, listen, these are people who are aligned with us. They're not making our work, making it making it visible how system change actually does happen from movements and not just from uh, talks in back rooms in the House of Commons, the House of Lords, various you know various offices in, in around Westminster. That because that that hasn't brought anything. So surely it's time to try something else. And sort of, I think that one of the things that's really been important is also trying to educate uh, scientists on why and how popular movements are important. That they're not just sort of messy interlopers, but that they're a part that you know they're part of democracy. I mean, it, it, it used to be quite common, sadly, to hear uh, people uh, who are climate scientists on the more natural and biological sciences side say, "Now, if only we had a good dictator." And and that's that's unacceptable, first of all, um, you know, sort of from a from an ethical standpoint, but that that was sort of like their 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 lack of ability to understand how social and economic change happens, really led them to say stuff like that quite, quite openly. And you know, if only we had a dictator, we'd get this, we'd, we'd sort this out. And it's like, no, democracy helps us. Because if you have real democracy, if you have structures like citizens assemblies, if you have um, ways that experts can communicate with people and those people can 
make demands and make decisions for themselves as to how they would like to see systems change. That's very different. That's a lot more accelerated, transformative, and um, effective potentially than asking people in power who have alliances with industry, who have alliances with economic sectors, with economic structures um, to, to change, right? So I think that there was also real, sort of a real, and there is still a real fundamental misunderstanding about how system change happens that, um, that held things back as well. Thank you. Um, Aaron, we, we've been talking here about, you know, scientists just not stepping up enough and, and, you know, not blaming anyone for that. But there have been a few players in this field who, well, I personally do blame. And I think the Science Museum stands out as one of those, um, which seems to hop into bed um, uh, with fossil fuel interests, despite everything, all the warnings that people are giving it. Could, could you tell us something about that and what's going on there? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think I think it's quite disgraceful, really, what's been happening. Um, so for those that don't know, the background to this is that Science Museum have uh, put on a new exhibit this year called Our Future Planet. Um, um, and it's about climate change and, and potential solutions to climate change. Um, but, um, and you'll be astonished uh, to hear, I'm sure your listeners, uh, the exhibit itself is being sponsored by Shell, the oil company. Um, and so, you know, this is, I think, a real clear example of, of corporate capture of our scientific institutions, where um, basically um, the Scientific Science Museum is, um, you know, sacrificing its reputation in order to greenwash Shell. Uh, it's completely ridiculous. So, um, you know, we know that Shell is not serious about tackling the climate uh, 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 crisis. It's continuing to explore for more fossil fuels, develop more more uh, oil and gas uh, fields. Um, we, we, you know, know that this is a, an organization which has denied uh, climate science for, for years, or at least funded denial campaigns, uh, despite their own internal documents making it really clear that they knew about it, um, you know, from the 1980s. Uh, and so, you know, this is a company which has done everything in its power to continue making profits uh, at the, uh, and prevent action on climate change. And the Science Museum is just welcoming it in and, and having them as an official sponsor of their, their exhibits. And, and not only that, but the science, you know, we've been protesting against this and, and really campaigning quite hard to, 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 to raise this as an issue within the museum. And, and so have a lot of other groups, including uh, the youth strikers who uh, were furious to find out that their own placards were used in this exhibit sponsored by Shell without them ever being asked their permission. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've been making a, a big fuss about this and a lot of uh, trustees now have actually resigned from the board of the Science Museum in protest. But the museum is digging their heels in, uh, the museum's management, that, that is. Uh, and at the moment, they've just announced that they're actually doing a new sponsorship deal with the coal conglomerate Adani. Uh, so, and that's for another climate exhibit that's supposed to be opening in 2023. I mean, that simply can't go ahead. So, so we're really gonna step up our, our efforts to, 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 again, make it clear that this is just completely inappropriate for our scientific institutions. But it's, it's not, I'm afraid, completely unique to uh, the Science Museum. You know, we, we know that fossil fuel companies um, saw uh, ca capturing scientific institutions as a key PR strategy. Uh, and what they've done is, you know, by sponsoring science research, sponsoring scientific institutes, they have made it very hard for scientists and um, uh, academic departments to speak out uh, against these companies and often actually have funded research that has, you know, then supported uh, some of the industry statements. So, for example, Ben Franta, a historian of science, has shown very clearly how by sponsoring economics departments in the United States, the fossil fuel interests have basically been able to, uh, you know, make sure that the voices of academic research in economics that gets heard uh, and gets funded are voices that are sympathetic to the fossil fuel industry's own position. And you know, that's the kind of where it gets really problematic for the public because they can start to not be able to distinguish between you know, objective, going back to that, um, or, or independent academic research and analysis, and that which is kind of supported and, and benefits the fossil fuel industry. 
Um, and it's often done at kind of this very uh, uh, removed kind of uh, way where, um, you know, they're not necessarily funding particular projects or, and uh, many of the researchers taking part in that research could, could justifiably say, well, you know, I never changed what I said to suit anybody's interest, which may well be true, but what the scientists and the economics uh, economists are not necessarily appreciating is that their own, uh, that the only reason that they got the funding in the first place is because uh, it, it suited the oil companies that they did so. And I think that's another reason why, you know, from my point of view, we really need to, to, to have, um, you know, our academic institutions um, uh, the research for that not being funded by, by and dependent on, you know, these fossil fuel fuel interests, because otherwise the, the whole um, academic debate gets muddied in, in very dangerous and damaging ways that confuse the public. Well, well th thanks very much, Aaron. Um, it's gone all too quickly, this programme. We're, we're almost at the very end now. Um, Emily, uh, just briefly now, could, could you um, sum up by issuing a call to scientists, really saying what you want other people in your profession to do in order to respond appropriately to the climate emergency? Yeah, so I think the call is that there are now scientists mobilising across the globe. There are huge communities growing in so many countries now across the globe who are joining with not just Extinction Rebellion, but other protest movements. Um, and and there's the school strikes as well. But of course, you know, the Scientists for Extinction Rebellion community, also known as Extinction Rebellion scientists, we are constantly welcoming new scientists who are coming in whatever way they want to take part Part. you know they don't have to be at risk of arrest you don't have to um you know put your career on the line for that but it's about just coming together in numbers and it's about supporting one another to actually go beyond simply reporting on the facts and to say you know that time has passed that time is over it's too late um for us to sort of continue to do that you know we have to we have to force action. And the way to force action is to come together in numbers to share the truth with absolutely everybody uh, using our platforms as scientists, using our platforms to influence others, using our social media, using our um, academic platforms. We need to make sure that everybody knows to the truth. We need to make sure that the only thing that we're doing now as scientists that has any real integrity, as well as doing our own re research, is to also be doing work to make sure that governments appropriately address the climate and ecological crisis and to make sure that the media appropriate appropriately report on the climate and ecological crisis so the call would be you know join extinction rebellion or protest movements where you can use your platform where you can use your expertise use the trust that you've built up use the credibility that you've built up to talk to people to spread the word to get to put pressure on businesses to put because you know, the only real action from the government can come if we, the people, get behind those demands as well. Because it's a bit of a sort of like catch-22 is the government won't take action until they know that the people that are behind them, otherwise they'll get voted out. You know, the people can't take action because the, the, the changes really do have to be systemic, They have, uh, like from the top down. It's, you know, whole societal changes. But the people need to get behind this as well. So as scientists, what we can do is we can role model. We can show the people that it really is this bad, that protest groups like Extinction Rebellion are not exaggerating, that this is not scaremongering. It really is this frightening that you personally feel frightened by this if you're a scientist watching or listening and that you personally want to inspire people to take action, whether or not you can do it yourself on the streets or whether or you can inspire people around you to take to the streets. Emily, thank you so much for, for, um, for finishing us off with that. That was oh, finishing us off, finishing the program off with that. Um, a, another really inspiring clarion call. Um, Emily Grossman, Julia Steinberger, Aaron Thierry. Uh, that was a fantastic discussion. Thank you so much to all of you. And thanks everyone for tuning in to Monbiosis on COP26.tv. Do please keep watching. Thank you.